Good morning. We'll call the meeting to order. Um, I thank you all for being here this morning. And our full committee hearing is on a U.S. defense posture changes in the European theater. Uh, we have two witnesses this morning. Um, Helpfully, both here and present, um, Dr. James Anderson, who is the Acting Undersecretary of Defense for Policy for the Department of Defense, and Lieutenant General David Alvin, Director for Strategy Plans and Policy with the Joint Chiefs of Staff. Sorry, I gotta unfog my glasses there for a second. Um, I'd like to welcome members who are joining today's markup remotely. Those members are reminded that they must be visible on screen within the software platform for the purposes of identity verification when joining the proceedings, establishing and maintaining a quorum, participating in the proceeding, and voting. Members participating remotely must continue to use the software platform's video function while attending the proceedings unless they experience connectivity issues or other technical problems that render the member unable to fully participate on camera. If a member who is participating remotely experiences technical difficulties, please contact the committee staff for assistance and they will help you get reconnected. When recognized, video of remotely attending members' participation will be broadcast in the room and via the television slash internet feeds. Members participating remotely are asked to mute their microphone when they are not speaking. Members participating remotely will be recognized normally for asking questions, but if they want to speak at another time, they must seek recognition verbally. In all cases, members are reminded to unmute their microphone prior to speaking. Members should be aware that there is a slight lag of a few seconds between the time you start speaking and the camera shot switching to you. Members who are participating remotely are reminded to keep the software platform video function on for the entirety of the time they attend the proceeding. These members may leave and rejoin the proceeding. If members depart for a short period for reasons other than joining a different proceeding, they should leave the video function on. If members will be absent for a significant period or depart to join a different proceeding, they should exit the software platform entirely and then rejoin it when they return. Members are also advised that I have designated a committee staff member to, if necessary, mute unrecognized members' microphones to cancel any inadvertent background noise that may disrupt the proceedings. Members may use the software platform's chat feature to communicate with staff regarding technical or logistical support issues only. Finally, remotely participating members should see a five-minute countdown clock on the software platform's display, but if necessary, I will remind members when their time is up. Um, only additional note that I would make on that is as you are asking questions and even for the witnesses, um, when you're not actually speaking, um, it's helpful to turn the microphone off because believe it or not, with the microphone on, it creates feedback up there. It gets confusing because then you got to go on and off and on and off. But if you can, can do that, it, it, it is helpful. Well, I thank the witnesses for being here today and the members for being present. I think this is a very important discussion. As we've heard uh, a little while back, an announcement was made as a change in our defense posture within Europe. And I want to make clear at the outset that I think it is always appropriate to re-examine our posture around the world. This is a rapidly changing world. The threat environment is dynamic. And our assets and allies are, are also reasonably dynamic. There are opportunities to be found in looking at ways that we can better distribute our assets and our forces to meet those challenges. But I was concerned about the way uh, this particular um, change in our posture was announced and is proposed to be implemented within Europe. There was an announcement basically of a need to reduce uh, the troops in Germany by 12,000. That number did not seem to be tied to any particular requirement. And then in addition to that, there was the requirement that we get rid of all of our headquarters in Germany. Um, the reasons for that were, were far from clear, so the numbers seemed to be artificial. Certainly, as we look at our needs in Europe and as we build and strengthen alliances with, with the relatively new Eastern European partners uh, within NATO, there are clearly opportunities to build on those partnerships and potentially uh, station U.S. troops in those Eastern European countries um, to improve our posture and better meet our defense needs, particularly with regards to deterring Russian aggression in that part of the world. I don't think this plan was particularly well thought out, and I'm worried about a number of aspects of its implementation. Um, the biggest one being the artificial number pulling troops out of Germany. You know, where, where did that number come from? And in particular, um, when we were briefed, um, and a few of us on the committee were briefed uh, a month or so ago about this, the decision to move AFRICOM out of Germany, which does not seem to make any sense. It's not that 
we couldn't have originally picked a better place in Europe or a different place in Europe at any rate. Uh, but having picked Germany and had AFRICOM there for the entirety of the command, the reasons for moving it don't seem to make sense. Except, as came out in the briefing, it was necessary to get to the 12,000 number. That is not the way we should be making policy, and it's going to be very, very expensive. Now, on the European command decision, um, we do have the presence in Mons Belgium that we've always had with shape, um, and there an argument can potentially be made. But nonetheless, it's very expensive to move these, these command structures, and what does it truly net us? Um, the second aspect of this, as you are aware, some of the forces that are being moved are, in a sense, being moved back uh, to the U.S., and they are becoming rotational. That, that has an impact, certainly, on the members serving, but also on our presence in those countries and on our ability to respond. Now, we, we have dramatically reduced the number of troops that we have in the European theater. I think at the height uh, of the Cold War in the mid-'80s, there was somewhere around 350,000 U.S. troops stationed in Europe. And in the current environment, having 350,000 U.S. troops in Europe would not make any sense whatsoever. But we reduced that number uh, down, if I'm correct, to, I think, roughly 62,000. So, so we have made that response. But if we then take some number of them and turn them into rotational troops, what does that do to our ability to, to meet our national security objectives in that part of the world? Because Russia is becoming more aggressive, not less. I think that that is something that there is bipartisan consensus on. Um, certainly their efforts in Ukraine have been very aggressive. Their efforts to disrupt democracy in any way that they can in Europe and the U.S. and elsewhere have grown. So I think our, our need to have a deterrence there is enormously important. Um, and, you know, I also am concerned about the effect it has on our partnerships in Europe because we definitely need friends and allies more than ever. And I feel very strongly that, as I think every member of this committee does, that the NATO alliance has served our country very well. And when we make these types of arbitrary decisions without working closely with our partners, that undermines that alliance. Even if in, in every partnership and every alliance, difficult things have to be done that maybe the partners won't like. But there's a way to do that. I do not, for instance, disagree at all that we should try uh, to do everything we can to get our European partners to contribute more uh, to the defense of Europe. I think that is appropriate. But if we do things to undermine the alliance in what appears to be a gratuitous way, without working with them, without listening to them, it undermines the strength of that alliance and plays right into Russia's hands. Because number one at the top of the list that, of the things that Russia wants to accomplish, reducing the power, cohesion, and strength of Western democracies is right at the top. They want to see us divided. They want to see NATO weakened. They want to see the NATO partners disagreeing and at each other's throats. We should not play into their hands. We should work with our European partners as we, as we put these plans in place. So it certainly makes sense to always have a conversation about what our posture should be in Europe. I think that the committee in a bipartisan way has deep concerns about the way this was done, the way it's going to be implemented, and how it's going to impact uh, the NATO alliance, our alliances in Europe in general, um, and our defense posture in Europe specifically. And I look forward to hearing from our witnesses and look forward to the, the Q&A to get greater detail on how those decisions were made going forward. With that, I yield uh, to the ranking member, Mr. Thornberry, for his opening statement. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, uh, and I appreciate having uh, this hearing on this topic. I agree that it is important, and in addition, uh, there are provisions in the current conference with the Senate uh, on this year's NDAA which touch on these issues. Uh, and there are a lot of questions, as, as you point out, and I fully agree that many of these questions arise because from the way that this announcement was made uh, and, and has subsequently been, been rolled out. Uh, I realize that the witnesses today are not going to be able to answer all of our questions about when or how much, but hopefully they can help clarify for us and the American people what and especially why. Some, as some of these moves seem to make 
sense on their face. Uh, for example, moving UCOM uh, to be closer to NATO headquarters, having a greater presence in the Balkans. But there needs to be an overall strategic plan that is coordinated with allies rather than have a bunch of rationalizations after the fact. Nate, I, I, I fully agree that NATO is the most successful alliance in history. Can it be improved? Absolutely. But we can't lose sight of what it has accomplished and what it means today for American national security. And so however logical some of these individual moves may be, there's still the broader question of doing this in this way has some effects on the strength and unity of the NATO alliance, and what is that? And so I hope our witnesses can shed a little light on the consultations, on uh, how this all fits together in the bigger picture, because it does seem to me However much or less sense individual moves may make, the main thing is the strength of NATO, uh, especially when dealing with a, a, an aggressive Russia. That's the main thing, and we need to have that in mind as we go through these details as well. I yield back. Thank you, and with that, I yield to Dr. Anderson for his opening statement. Chairman Smith, Ranking Member Thornberry, distinguished members of the committee, thank you for the invitation to testify on recent European force structure posture realignment alongside Lieutenant General David Alvin. He is a great partner, and it is an honor to appear beside him. The Department continues to prioritize implementation of the National Defense Strategy, NDS, including the building of a more lethal force and strengthening alliances. One important initiative to advance the NDS and focus and to ensure a focus on these priorities is the ongoing comprehensive review of all combatant commands. As part of U.S. European Command, U.S. UCOM review, Secretary Esper directed UCOM to develop options for reposturing our Europe-based Europe forces to compete more effectively and respond to contingencies both within Europe and globally. These options will be guided by Secretary Esper's five core principles. One, enhancing deterrence of Russia. Two, strengthening NATO. Three, reassuring allies. Four, improving U.S. strategic flexibility and UCOM's operational flexibility. And most importantly, five, taking care of our service members and their families. On July 29, Secretary Esper announced an update to the status of our U.S. European Command Force Posture Review following a decision by the President in early June to limit the number of assigned active duty service members in Germany to 25,000, as well as the DOD concept to reposition some of our forces within Europe and back to the United States to be better situated for great power competition. The review yielded a concept for nearly 12,000 military personnel to be repositioned from Germany with almost 5,600 restationed in other NATO countries and approximately 6,400 returning to the United States. The realignment concept includes consolidating headquarters to strengthen operational agility, repositioning some forces in the United States to focus on readiness and to prepare for rotational deployments, and deploying rotational forces to the Black Sea region on NATO's southeastern flank to improve deterrence. The concept consists of the following four pillars. Thank you. First, the consolidation of various U.S. headquarters in Europe outside Germany, including in some cases co-locating headquarters at the same locations as their NATO counterparts in Belgium and Italy. This would help strengthen NATO and improve operational efficiency and readiness of more than 2,000 service members in these headquarters. Second, the nearly 4,500 members of the 2nd Cavalry Regiment would return to the United States as other striker units begin rotations farther east in the Black Sea region, giving us a more enduring presence to enhance deterrence and reassure allies along NATO's southeastern flank. Third, 2,500 airmen based at the Royal Air Force base in Middenholm, United Kingdom, who are responsible for aerial refueling and special operations, and who had been scheduled to rebase to Germany, would remain in the UK, thus ensuring uninterrupted readiness and responsiveness of these units. 
Fourth, a fighter squadron and elements of a fighter wing would be re repositioned to Italy, moving them closer to the Black Sea region and rendering them more capable to conduct dynamic force employment and rotational deployments to NATO's southeastern flank. This concept to reposition our forces in Europe constitutes a major strategic shift. Wholly in line with the NDS and consistent with other adjustments the U.S. has previously made within NATO. Over NATO's 71-year history, the size, composition, and disposition of U.S. forces in Europe has changed many times. As our planning for the current realignment matures, we will be sure to communicate fre frequently with Congress and with our NATO allies to maintain visibility and foster cooperation. As we continue to implement the NDS, our efforts at enhancing our European posture beyond the UCOM Combatant Command Review have, been, have shown recent successes, including the signing of the Enhanced Defense Cooperation Agreement with Poland in August that will enable an incre increased enduring U.S. rotational presence in that country of about 1,000 U.S. military personnel. These elements are in addition to the 4,500 U.S. military personnel already on rotation in Poland and includes infrastructure and logistical support provided by Poland. Our continued efforts to streamline operations across Europe, including through modernized and new agreements with NATO, NATO allies, especially on the eastern flank, directly support our NDS principles by improving operational flexibility and enhancing deterrence. The Department is confident that these continuing efforts will help us adapt the force and optimize our force posture in Europe as we seek to deter malign actors. Thank you for the opportunity to testify today. I look forward to your questions. Thank you. General Alvin. Chairman Smith, Ranking Member Thornberry, distinguished members of the committee, thank you for inviting me here to be with you today. As Dr. Anderson noted, the Joint Staff partners closely with our OSD and U.S. European Command, or UCOM, colleagues to provide credible military options to the Secretary of Defense and the President on U.S. military presence in Europe in support of national security objectives. The 2018 National Defense Strategy describes the erosion and longstanding rules-based international order, which has created an increasingly complex and volatile global security environment. Russian aggression and malign influence is accelerating this decline in Europe, with cascading effects across the globe. As General Walters, the commander of U.S. UCOM, stated in testimony earlier this year, over the past 12 years, Russia has invaded two neighboring states, violated the Intermediate Range Nuclear Forces Treaty, leading to the treaty's termination developed new strategic platforms, and abrogated its responsibilities under the Treaty on Conventional Armed Forces in Europe. This has been done at the expense of strategic stability. It is because serious threats from Russia and China that this January, uh, January 2020, Secretary Esper directed a series of combatant command reviews to focus on strategic priorities across the globe and realign forces in support of the national defense strategy. A particular relevance to Europe the NDS calls for the joint force to maintain a favorable balance of power in Europe, deter adversaries from aggression against our vital interests, and defend allies from military aggression while bolstering partners against coercion. These objectives are accomplished through the three distinct lines of effort, building more lethal joint force, strengthening alliances, and reforming the department's business practices. But technological and geopolitical influence on the character of war necessitates the evolution and not only the tools with which we fight, but the operational concepts and the general posture of our forces. In many ways, those concepts of U.S. forces in Europe have not markedly changed since the last huge force reduction following the fall of the Berlin Wall, as well as subsequent changes since. Large formations of permanent forces can present vulnerabilities and are not best suited to flexibly respond to emergent threats across the globe and outside of their current area of operations. The current environment requires increased strategic flexibility and freedom of action. The National Defense Strategy unveiled the concept of dynamic force employment, which prioritizes maintaining the readiness of the joint force for major combat while providing options for proactive and scalable employment for deterrence and assurance. This concept is critical to UCOM posture, the UCOM posture realignment. Under the dynamic force employment concept, Episodic introduction of forces across the region presents dilemmas to potential adversaries while providing the Secretary and the President with the flexibility and capacity to rapidly respond to emergent threats across the globe. 
operational flexibility is equally important. Since the dissolution of the Soviet Union, the ideological border separating East from West has gradually shifted in favor of a free and open international order. New allies are joining NATO, but these gains must be reinforced. Nations along the Black Sea and Baltic Sea, for, entrance, for instance, are under direct and persistent military pressure from Russia. Presenting forces further east will reduce the response time and increase the deterrence to Russian aggression. Moving forces in and out of the European theater, as is done with rotational forces, also exercises the joint reception, staging, onward movement, and integration capabilities, which must be sharp to support ongoing contingency plans in the region. None of this is possible without allies and partners. And over the past 75 years, the U.S. has benefited from a growing constellation of alliances and partnerships. These bilateral and multilateral accords, with the North Atlantic Treaty as a shining example, serve as a strategic and asymmetric advantage against revisionist powers such as Russia. The transatlantic alliance is strengthened by the complementary capabilities, unique perspectives, relationships, and regional access provided by our NATO allies. Collaborative planning is necessary to coalesce these diverse viewpoints and competencies into an interoperable force which acts together to achieve common military objectives. Co-location of the NATO headquarters with the UCOM headquarters will enhance the NATO collaborative planning with the UCOM staff and build upon recent enhancements to the NATO command structure. During Secretary Esper's 29 July briefing, he affirmed that the realignment of US forces in Europe plan is subject to and likely will change to some degree as it evolves over time. In his role as the global integrator, Chairman Milley continues to capture the views of the combatant commanders and the Joint Chiefs so that he may provide military advice to the Secretary and President on updates and refinements to the plan to address the strategic and operational threats at the speed of relevance. We also acknowledge that the best plans are born through consultation with allies and continued engagement with Congress. We are committed to this collaborative approach. During the 29 July brief, the Vice Chairman, General Hyten, mentioned the department structure process required to translate this concept into action. I would like to offer some additional insight into the process and provide a bit of a roadmap going forward. The realignment of forces outside of U.S. territory requires structured engagements between the Department of Defense, the interagency, allied host nations, and inter international organizations in addition to this body. These engagements generally involve a three-part process planning, approvals, and implementation. Timelines for completion depend on the complexity, scale, and scope of the proposed change. The planning stage has already begun as the UCOM commander continues to iterate the posture concept with stakeholders across the department and will provide updates and considerations to the secretary in the weeks and months to come. As the plan matures, the department's Global Posture Executive Council, called the GPEC, co-chaired by the Assistant Secretary of Defense for Strategy, Plans, and Capabilities, and the Director of the Joint Staff will support this effort through a deliberal, deliberative, comprehensive process. This includes developing the requirements for manpower, infrastructure, and agreements in order to inform budgetary estimates. The services will determine whether the capacity exists to support the additional forces, along with the funding requirements for the military construction, if applicable, of operational and support facilities, which they will request from Congress. These facilities can range from increases in apron parking spaces for an arriving squadron to new barracks, family housing, school, or medical facilities. The services must also evaluate support for service members and their families residing in and around the installation, such as morale and welfare programs, family service support, DOD schools, and childcare. If an installation is expanded or, closes the or closed, the services must account for impacts to our U.S. and host nation civilian workforce. The planning stage also involves early host nation consultation. Building infrastructure requires adherence to U.S. and host nation environmental regulatory requirements, as well as negotiations with the host nation on utilities, airspace management, and historical site mitigations, for example. Simultaneously, planning is necessary for divestment of installations being closed. The approval stage... I'm sorry, John, if you could wrap up. We do want to get to members' questions here. Yes, sir. Finally, we must remember that our most precious resources are military men and women and their families. 
Any realignment will have an impact on our people, which is why Secretary Esper and Chairman Milley are committed to ensuring the needs of our service members and their families are paramount as we execute this realignment. Thank you again for this opportunity, and I look forward to answering your questions. Thank you very much. Uh, Dr. Anderson, could you explain the um, pros and cons balance between permanent forces and rotational forces? That seems to be one of the biggest changes on the posture side that was contained in this, was to shift more towards rotational forces. Yes, the, uh, the basic advantage of rotational forces is they provide uh, additional flexibility. Um, and they do so both at the strategic level, which is important for the president and the secretary, and also at the operational level, which is important to the uh, UCOM combatant commander. Uh, that is the, uh, the, the main advantage of uh, rotational forces. Um, Flex, two questions about that. Mm -hmm. One, what are the downside? And two, uh, flexibility to do what? Um, flexibility sounds like a nice word, but it doesn't actually tell us anything. So what flexibility to do what, and then what are the downsides of the forces being rotational instead of fully present? So I, I don't see any downsides to being uh, rotational, but there, there is a, a cost uh, involved in transitioning from uh, permanent forces to rotational. Well, I guess I would ask if there are no downsides to being rotational forces, why do we have any permanent forces? So there are uh, certain um, uh, air bases and hubs and logistic logistical facilities that uh, do need to be permanent. There, there is virtue there as we are able to move forces and flow forces to various contingencies around the world. So um, saying that there's benefits to rotational forces doesn't mean there's still some value in certain cases to permanent forces. And as, uh, as to your other question on uh, flexibility to, to do what, um, it's the flexibility to, to meet those uh, uh, emerging or, or um, emergent uh, crises or, uh, or conflicts uh, which uh, may arise and the, the flexibility to uh, take different forces and, and move them to different regions of the world or, or move them within the European theater uh, provides uh, advantages and it complicates uh, adversary uh, decision making uh, and, and, uh, and that's, that is a good thing. Okay. Uh, Mr. Thornberry. Dr. Anderson, you used the word concept several times, and frankly, I'm confused uh, or not clear about where this stands. Uh, is, is, have we given an outline of moves that we will make and now we're working through the details, or is this a concept in, in a sense that uh, if our allies say we don't like that, we could abandon it. So we have uh, outlined uh, to our allies, our NATO allies, uh, the moves as we've described here. And uh, it's, I, I describe it as a, a concept with planning underway. Uh, because there's uh, a great deal of that uh, to be done uh, going forward. As, as you know, sir, the department has very structured processes uh, to plan and uh, receiving um, the secretary's guidance and the president's direction, um, we are proceeding along those lines. Now, I would also add that uh, as with any major uh, plan, uh, you know, it, there, it is subject to you know, revisions and modifications going forward. Um, but uh, that's, that's how I would describe it. And as I said in my opening statement, we, uh, we commit to continuing to consult with, uh, with Congress going forward. You mentioned several times uh, in your opening statement, well, actually you both did, the national defense strategy. I, I brought the summary with me. There's a whole section, as you will recall, about strengthening alliances and attracting partners. There's a section on upholding the foundation of mutual respect, responsibility, and priorities, expanding consultative mechanisms, and so forth. Are you aware of any consultation with allies uh, that, were, that was made before the roughly June 2020 uh, announcement that we were going to remove troops from Germany? So prior to the uh, the public rollout, um, we did uh, we did um, speak with our, our NATO allies. I personally reached out to my counterparts, and I know my uniform colleagues as well. Um, I'm, I'm sorry to interrupt, but I'm, 
the public rollout? Is this Secretary Esper's description of the specific moves? Yes, sir. Or Okay, so I'm, my question was, back in June, the National Security Advisor had an op-ed in the Wall Street Journal. There were, there were at least leaks before that. Were there consultations, to your knowledge, before that, was, that announcement or op-ed were made? So I was not involved in those consultations, but I do know that uh, Secretary Esper did uh, task uh, uh, combatant commander early in, uh, earlier this year, very early in the year, uh, to begin uh, some planning for uh, force posture adjustments. I, uh, I, I believe that in that context, uh, it's, uh, it's, it's a fair assumption that there were some discussions with close allies about different possibilities. Hmm. Well, I've, I've met with several uh, of uh, either ambassadors or defense ministers, and uh, my sense is this caught them all by surprise. Let, let me just ask one, uh, one other question. Uh, would you agree that the extent to which there is uh, a chaos, disunity within NATO actually is of assistance to the Russians? So I, I would uh, respectfully disagree with the characterization of chaos. With no, the, I, I, I'm just, I'm not saying this mm -hmm. creates chaos. I'm, I'm just trying to get back to my fundamental point that the unity and strength of NATO is of paramount importance when it comes to deterring Russia. And on that point, I would agree wholeheartedly. Yeah. Yes, sir. And we can agree, this may, we may not agree, or I don't know, about the, whether individual actions may cause chaos, but my, my main question I wanted is that unity of NATO is an important deterrence. Yes, indeed. Okay, all right, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Okay, Mr. Langevin is recognized for five minutes. Mr. Langevin is uh, participating remotely, so we'll give him a second to queue up. Uh, Jim, yep. thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, can you hear me okay? Yes. Okay, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I, I wanna thank our witnesses for for being here today to discuss the need to maintain uh, our defense posture in Europe. And uh, I'm sure we can all agree uh, our greatest strength in deterring uh, Russian uh, aggression is, uh, is our allies. So my, uh, my question, uh, let me begin with this. You know, a, a realignment plan, and, and certainly my view and, and that of many others, should fix something that, that isn't working. Uh, Dr. Anderson, what, what problems currently exist that necessitates such a, a, a costly large-scale realignment? And additionally, uh, how do you assess our, our existing uh, allies, such as Germany, will view this plan? Um, I'm sorry, could somebody re repeat that question? I couldn't quite hear it. Yeah, I'll, I'll try it again. Uh, I'm sorry, uh, let me, that, I, go ahead, Jim. Uh, can you hear me better now? If I I, speak we up hear you closer? fine, as soon as I can tell. Go ahead. Yes. Okay, I asked, uh, a realignment plan should fix something that isn't working. And uh, so Dr. Anderson, I wanted to ask what problem currently exists that necessitates such a cost of large scale realignment. Additionally, uh, how do you assess our existing allies to Germany with this plan? The, ba the basic question is, what wasn't working, what were you trying to fix, and how do you think Germany feels about this? Thank you. So, as uh, you know, as, as mentioned and, and discussed earlier, uh, we uh, we look at posture uh, on a on a routine basis, uh, how we're doing around the world, and certainly in the context of the uh, Secretary of Defense uh, directed uh, combatant command reviews, um, this is uh, and, and by the way, which is not just wasn't just focused on on UCOM, but was uh, is is an across the board review of all our combatant commands. Um, we we looked at how how well our current posture is uh, is uh, deterring uh, our competitors, and we looked at uh, uh, how efficient our disposition of, of troops uh, is. And in that context, uh, we have come up with uh, you know a, a plan going forward uh, to enhance that posture and to uh, align with the uh, the five principles articulated by by Secretary Esper. So in the case of, uh, of Germany, um, you know, they, uh, they probably, you know, they, they have some, some, uh, some different ideas perhaps about to what would be the ideal posture, but these are our are, are forces. Um, uh, at, the, 
at the invitation of, uh, of Germany. And uh, I, would, I would argue that uh, you know, change is, can, can, can be hard because change is different, uh, but we're, uh, we're quite confident that these changes will in fact be beneficial not only to the United States, but our, all our NATO allies. I would also note in the broader context of European NATO history, um, uh, there have been multiple changes uh, over time in terms of our force posture okay. in Okay, let me, I'm going I'm to stop you there if I could. Uh, I, my time is running down. I, I have to be honest with you that I'm really having a trouble, I'm, I'm in trouble uh, connecting the dots with this is fixing a problem uh, that, uh, that really I don't think exists right now. In fact, I think it's going to cause more problems uh, than anything it's going to solve. But let me turn to this. Uh, our approach to deterrence obviously has to be a whole of government approach, not uh, solely reliant on the DOD. When deciding these, these riot realignment plans, what role does and did the State Department play and, and what inputs have they provided during this process? And I think the, the ranking member uh, touched on this, but I think it's important to address and expand upon it. Yeah, I'm, I'm sorry, what role did the, could somebody summarize the, the question? I'm having a hard the time state, the state, The State Department, what role do they have uh, in this uh, and uh, what inputs do they have in the process? So I, I know that uh, I, I talk to my State Department colleagues all the time and I know that Secretary Esper talks with Secretary Pompeo and uh, you know, prior to the rollout, we did uh, discuss this uh, posture realignment with our, our friends across the river. Okay, it, it doesn't sound like, it sounded to me then it's more, it was ad hoc as opposed to a well thought out State Department uh, process and involvement. So um, uh, with that, I know my chant time's running down, so I'll, I'll yield back to you. Uh, thank you, Mr. Wilson's recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank each of you for being here today uh, to bring us up to date on the European theater. I'm particularly grateful that President Trump has expanded the troop presence in Poland. This is a deterrence uh, to Putin aggression. Uh, and it's special to me, I have a Polish-American daughter-in-law. And so uh, the recognition of how important that country is uh, to all of us, and has been. Uh, and then I had the opportunity to meet with President Andrzej Duda in New York and thank him for the warm welcome of American troops. Uh, in fact, there's been speculation that the base could be called Fort Trump. Uh, the key point is that uh, we really appreciate and recognize the importance of Poland uh, to deter aggression. And Secretary Anderson, I was an election observer in Bulgaria in 1990 for the parliamentary elections, which represented the historic transition to a democratic society, a dream come true of democracy in Bulgaria. I visited our base there in Novo Selo in 2008 at its meager beginning, and now it's a world-class training facility which has been really uh, reinforced by Prime Minister Boyko Borisov. Additionally, I visited MK Air Base in Romania with Congresswoman Madeleine Baidayo when it was established as a logistics hub for the global war on terrorism, but it's now modernized to be the heel-to-toe rotations for armored brigade combat teams in Europe. What is your assessment of our relationship with NATO allies, Bulgaria and Romania, including the strategic locations of Novo Cell and MK for the European Defense Initiative. So first on uh, uh, Poland, we certainly uh, agree they're a strong uh, NATO ally and, and uh, we believe the enhanced uh, defense cooperation agreement is gonna make that uh, partnership even, uh, even stronger uh, with our, rotational, our additional rotational forces there. Um, with the, uh, uh, both Bulgaria and Romania uh, are, are relatively new to, to NATO, having joined in uh, 2000, 2004 with other countries, but they have made uh, tremendous strides, uh, as your question suggests, in terms of modernization and professionalization. Uh, so we, uh, we absolutely are, are looking to them um, as, we, uh, as we reposition and, and move, uh, additional rotation, move additional rotational forces uh, through those two countries. Uh, we think that this will strengthen deterrence along uh, NATO's uh, southeastern flank in, uh, in a very positive way. Um, and so we're, uh, we're excited about this possibility. Thank you very much. And uh, Mr. Secretary, uh, there's always going to be um, tensions between commitments that we have in other areas of the world. 
such as the uh, Indo-PACOM region, uh, recognizing the importance now of uh, al the alliance that we have uh, with India and how far that's come. The American security commitments to UCOM, though obviously we need to maintain, and uh, how do we do this uh, to be committed to our European allies, to our uh, Asian allies? Uh, what is the latest on the strategic gains of our military over the last year with our partners and allies in Europe? How can we better prepare America and our strategic allies to desert to our adversaries? So in the context of great power competition, which we outline in the national defense strategy, uh, we, we are very concerned, obviously, about our, our competitors, both the People's Republic of China and the Russian Federation. Uh, the United States is a European power. It's also a Pacific power. Uh, we can and we are and we will continue to uh, have commitments in both regions and, and deter on, on both, uh, both those fronts. I would add that the rotational element of this current plan here uh, gives us more uh, flexibility, both again at the strategic level and at the operational level. So what that means in very practical terms is that some of the troops currently positioned in Europe that will be coming back to the United States and then will have the inherent flexibility to uh, respond to any number of global contingencies uh, but they will still retain a, a keen focus on deploying back to Europe on a rotational basis. Excellent. Thank you. And uh, General uh, Alvin, there's no doubt that China and Russia are our main competitors uh, and they continue malign activity uh, in Africa. What is the Security Force Assistant Brigade's um, support for AFRICOM? And I do apologize, but you got about 15 seconds to answer that question. <laughs> Go ahead. Absolutely. I would say this is one of the great uh, developments that the United States Army has done to be able to adapt to the environment and understand it's not all about high-end combat, but sometimes you have to compete, and those multi mil cooperation uh, arrangements that the SFAB really uh, primes on is, is important to be able to compete across the globe. It's, You're here. It's Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Larson is recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I yield my time to Representative Houlihan of Pennsylvania. Thank you, Mr. Larson, and thank you all for coming. Uh, before I start with my question, I don't. I want to kind of pause for a minute on Representative Wilson's comments regarding troops in Poland and. Uh, uh, respectfully disagree. I'm not certain that it is necessarily a deterrence, uh, but possibly an escalation by moving troops to Poland. And my father is Polish born, and so I personally have heard from him about the history of that war-torn area of our, of our planet, and I worry about that. Uh, but my questions are for you, Dr. Anderson, and it's my understanding that this realignment will affect our posture in Africa. And so what is the process that the department will be using to determine where it will be relocated AFRICOM headquarters, and could you please describe what assessment you've made of how the realignment would affect our presence in Africa? So, uh, as uh, as outlined on the, the 29th, the uh, the public rollout, rollout the uh, the uh, AFRICOM headquarters, which is currently in, uh, in Stuttgart, Germany, will be moving to a different location uh, to be determined. And uh, there will be a, a number of factors uh, in, involved there in making that determination, and including uh, uh, cost and uh, receptivity of, of uh, host nations, if it's going to be based in Europe or even in Africa, or if it were uh, to move back to the United States, which this is yet another possibility. Obviously, you know, the services would be involved in, uh, in, uh, in consultation with Congress about potential uh, destinations. So uh, uh, cost and uh, operational efficiency um, would, and uh, as applicable, any host, host nation permissions, those would all be among the uh, variables that the department uh, would have to assess. So do we have that sort of data on where it currently exists so that we could compare whatever the two options or three options are? And why would we decide just to move, just to move without any sort of information or data about where our staying put would put us in terms of a cost benefit analysis? So I don't have, uh, I don't have uh, th those details on the current uh, cost of maintaining that headquarters. Uh, but I am confident that we will uh, we will find operational efficiencies in uh, in, in moving that and also uh, meeting the presidential presidentially directed uh, cap of our forces in uh, in Germany. 
And how would you make an assessment of what the effect would be with our, our relationship um, in Africa, our presence in Africa? What sort of uh, factors would come into play there? You mentioned specifically maybe moving to the United States, which sort of doesn't seem like a sensible solution. So I, I was uh, I worked in the Pentagon in the, uh, in the in the 2000s, and I remember well the uh, the vigorous debates that ensued at that time when Africom was uh, was established on where it uh, could or should be located, and uh, it's my full expectation that we will have a similarly vigorous debate uh, this time around on on the potential destinations of Africom, and I know that uh, General Townsend. The uh, combat commander from, for AFRICOM is, is working with his staff to uh, develop such options. Thank you. And with the remainder of my time, General Alvin, uh, this question is probably uh, in the classified environment, but I would like to just put it out there and potentially have a follow-up with you. With you. Uh, I would be interested to know if, you're de if the department has updated operation plans uh, for various Russian-related uh, contingencies given the proposed changes to our posture in Europe. Uh, Congresswoman, yes, we can certainly go into more detail at a higher level of classification. I will tell you that uh, the UCOM staff did consider those when they were developing uh, this realignment posture, uh, the concept as well. That they were considered uh, both the current ones and, and including some of the shortfalls and the opportunities with this, but I can go at, it at a higher classification level with you. And would we be able to follow up with you on, on more details on that at a different classification level? Yes, ma'am. Okay, thank you. My last question is also for you, and I'm curious to see how UCOM is working with allied agencies to counter Russian cyber threats and how the proposed posture changes would affect that work. I, I know that the, uh, the actually from, from Ben uh, on the staff from 2015 to 2018, I, I've been heartened in the last couple of years to see the actual improvement uh, in the capabilities in the cyber realm within U.S. European Command to be able to not only address those, but also reach out to um, some potentially vulnerable, and I, that's about as much as I can go to in this classification level, um, partners within the region. Uh, I would say that uh, uh, the, the assessment, I would have to defer uh, to U.S. European Command for a specific assessment. I would say in general, though, the relationships and specifically how it uh, pertains to um, cyber engagements and movements on that front, uh, I would not anticipate a big change either way on that from the current positive path that it's on, but I would have to yield, uh, and I, we can get back to you for the record with UCOM for more details if you'd like on that. Thank you, I appreciate it. I've run out of time, and thank you, Representative, and I yield back to the Chair. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Turner is recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I want to begin by stating that I share the chairman and the ranking member skepticism concerning uh, this plan, but I want to uh, associate myself with uh, the comments of uh, Mr. Wilson. Um, the, um, I think it's very important for us to have forward deployed troops and having participated in observance of war games in Poland, I know how important um, our presence in Poland is um, in deterrence with respect to, to Russia. General, um, I want to begin with you. Um, you were involved in the formulation of this plan, correct? I was not personally involved in the formulation of this plan. Okay. Yeah. Um, have you reviewed the process upon which the formulation occurred? Did you had conversations with those who were putting the plan together? I have. Are you aware whether or not the, Rush, the NATO Russia Founding Act of 1997 had, a, had an impact in the formulation of this plan, which prohibits the forward deployment of troops on a permanent basis in former Warsaw Pact countries? I, I did uh, consult with uh, those who were developing the plan afterwards to ensure that the NATO Russia Founding Act was taken into consideration, and they assured me that it was taken into consideration because of the the um, the wording in the NATO Russia Founding Act talks about significant forces Permanent. permanently stationed rather than rotational. Now, Russia doesn't see it that way, right, General? I mean, Russia believes that rotational forces that are um, that have a continuing presence are in fact permanent. Isn't that their objection that they've made to this plan? That's their objection. I, I don't know that that's what they believe in their hearts or if that's part of the competition rhetoric. If, if there wasn't the NATO-Russia Founding Act, would we have approached this differently? I would have to yield to the UCOM staff for that. I, I think uh, we, we look at the ev evolution of the strategic environment and take that into account, but I can't speak on their behalf as to whether that would have significantly altered the path. General, if we're in a conflict with Russia, do you believe that the Atlantic is contested space? 
I do. Wouldn't that mean that by having rotational forces that it complicates our ability to, to rotate forces, to augment, supplement, uh, or to, to even, as uh, Dr. Anderson was saying, to, to give us the flexibility as to what we have uh, in, in Europe? Congressman, to keep it at this classification level, I would say that while uh, our ability to rotate forces into the theater would be challenged, um, the existence of the amount of permanent presence forces there would be insignificant, would not be significant enough to uh, successfully engage decisively the Russians in a conflict. So one would still have to deploy significant amounts of forces in which the Atlantic would be contested regardless. General, when you commit to rotational forces as to opposed to permanent forces, isn't it true that rotational forces can actually have an increased cost above what permanent basing of forces would be? I would yield to the services for that, but it is my understanding that there is an increased cost. Now that that can be uh, that, that can be uh, mitigated through different means, whether it be keeping the equipment there or not. Th there are different ways that it can be mitigated, and the advantages of rotational uh, forces uh, can outweigh that. I would yield to the services for that. Dr. Anderson, um, Russia has obviously been in violation of the NATO Russia founding act. Uh, they too had uh, representations in the, uh, in the agreement, which is not a treaty and is not therefore binding to the United States. Um, and their uh, incursions both into Georgia and to Ukraine would certainly be uh, violations of those act, of that act. Um, if the, um, if the Russian, if the NATO Russia founding act was not being adhered to by the United States in this plan, would you have scoped it differently, and would you have looked at placing permanent troops for based? Uh, I would also have to defer to the UCOM staff on on those uh, on, on that particular question. But I, I would say that I would just reemphasize the the value of the rotational forces. The cost is a consideration. Um, in, in some cases, it may go up, but in, in other cases, uh, with the rotational forces, you don't have uh, the cost associated with uh, with families being PCS overseas. So that would in fact be a cost savings. Uh, again, once you get through kind of a transition period, uh, which is envisioned to take uh, years. Well, Dr. Anderson, I'm not a fan of the United States adhering to uh, agreements that Russia continuously violates. And I do fear that in this instance, we may be scoping our plans and policies by limiting ourselves uh, to an act that, that is at this point meaningless. Thank you, I yield back. Thank you, uh, Mr. Courtney. And for um, and for uh, holding this hearing and to our witnesses for being here today, um, you know one aspect of this plan which we haven't talked about, which strikes me as one of the oddest um, part of the proposal, is um, the uh, scaling back of the continuous presence of our Marines in Norway. Uh, again, uh, last October, uh, Mr. Norcross and I uh, spent some time uh, in Norway. Uh, again, meeting with defense officials, uh, members of the uh, Norwegian military. The tempo of anti-submarine warfare activity that the U.S. is collaborating with, with Norway has uh, gone through the roof uh, in the last few years, which I'm sure both witnesses are very familiar with. Um, and uh, as a government and, and as a country, they, uh, again, for so many reasons, are so critical as an ally. A, uh, they are the, the NATO member in the high north. They, um, again, are a whisker away from hitting their NATO uh, GDP target in terms of uh, defense spending, and we went through, again, the increases that they've been investing in in a whole variety uh, of areas that's there, uh, and uh, they border uh, Russia. Um, so, you know, the rationale about uh, ending continuous presence of the Marine um, uh, Corps in, in Norway, uh, this, this committee has spent really the last five years uh, on a bipartisan basis supporting uh, the European Defense Initiative as a way of reassuring our allies. And, and that was a big part of the conversations that we were having uh, with defense officials and government officials while we were there. So um, explain what, what was the rationale of, of, of doing that. Uh, again, at a very critical time with a, with a country that's uh, obviously really hitting above its weight in the region um, as an ally of this country, what has been, been the reaction 
Uh, and, and given the fact that they did the Black Sea rotations out of Norway with that marine um, unit, uh, and, and that uh, purportedly is one of the things that you're focused on, how is, that any, how is the newly planned rotations to the Black Sea any different than what we're already doing with, with those troops that are in Norway? So a couple of points. Um, yeah, NATO, uh, Norway remains a key, uh, actually a founding member of NATO, and an obvious importance for its uh, geographic location, as you uh, as, as you noted, sir. The um, you know the Marine Corps is uh, as an uh, expeditionary force and readiness, you know, has has decided that it. Uh, um, you know, they are going to continue to take advantage of uh, the relationship that we have with Norway uh, and the fact that we have uh, pre-positioned pre uh, equipment up there, uh, but just do so in a different way, in a more rotational way uh, that will give, provide uh, additional flexibility and also uh, is very consistent with the national defense strategy and the emphasis on uh, dynamic force employment, um, where we don't necessarily uh, telegraph, uh, you know, all our movements uh, years in advance. Uh, you know, we can do things on, on short notice. We can uh, change the schedule up uh, in a way that's uh, operationally unpredictable. Uh, and that's, that's, the Marine Corps is very capable of moving quickly. Um, and this is something that will, uh, as talked about earlier, provide the United States with, uh, with, uh, with some, some additional benefits. So do they, I mean, so you're saying this actually enhances um, you know the the ability to uh, be to have a, a deterrence capability um, in in that region. That, that's that's your statement today. Yeah, combined with the uh, the other moves uh, described uh, uh, with respect to this uh, posture realignment, uh, I, yes, I do believe it's going to enhance deterrence. So, so and again, uh, the question regarding the Black Sea rotations, which again already are occurring with those Marines in Norway today, how is the newly planned Black Sea? What's the change there? What's the the benefit for not using, uh, or you know, Norway's um, unit as as the as the resource? So one of the one of the the, the main pieces in vision with the uh, the posture realignment is that um, there will be some striker uh, striker units that will be moving to the uh, uh, the Black Sea region, um, and on a on a rotational basis. So that is, uh, I'm, I'm not aware that uh, Marines that were up in Norway are necessarily moving uh, or planning to rotate to the Black Sea region. They might, um, but uh, that, I mean, again, that's part of the, uh, the value of having this uh, rotational flexibility. They are, and they are actually uh, doing, doing precisely that, and uh, with that, I yield back. Uh, thank you, Ms. Hartzler. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I wanted to focus both uh, Dr. Anderson and uh, Lieutenant General Al Alvin on the 2020 agreement that was signed with Poland, um, setting the conditions for burden sharing and, and moving the troops, uh, 1,100 more service members into Poland. So was there or is there any discussion about moving more of the troops from Germany into Poland instead of re relocating those troops back to the United States? And is a permanent U.S. base in Poland something that you foresee uh, may happen? So I'll start uh, on that one. Uh, you know, we do have approximately 4,500 troops uh, in, in, in on a rotational basis going through Poland. and. The agreement that was signed uh, this summer uh, by the president and his counterpart uh, envisions uh, another another thousand uh, thereabouts uh, being uh, deployed on a rotational basis, and it will include elements of the uh, Fifth Corps uh, headquarters uh, element, um, and that uh, that will provide uh, our army units uh, clearly in Europe with uh, uh, additional uh, sort of eastward presence that they 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 do not currently have. Um, and we think that, uh, you know, on a the rotational uh, basis is, uh, is the appropriate uh, uh, agreement with the, uh, the Polish government. So you don't see any of the troops that are currently in Germany being moved to be uh, part of the 1100 that's over in Poland? Uh, no, ma'am. Those are, they're, 
I, I would describe the, the European force posture restructuring and the, uh, the enhanced uh, defense cooperation agreement as, uh, as separate but complementary uh, in their impact and their effect. So I was in Poland last year with several, some of my other colleagues here, Hass, we were at uh, Poznan, we were at Powitz, the uh, air base there, and um, can attest that a lot of the training facilities are pretty austere in uh, Poland. I understand that's one of the uh, issues that needs to be addressed, the development of training range infrastructure, and uh, it's my understanding that Poland has agreed to help uh, pay for that and to construct that. Can you tell me both the timeline of that and what is the nature of the training grounds that will need to be constructed? So the, the Enhanced Defense Cooperation Agreement does uh, uh, allow for, uh, does provide for the Polish government to uh, assist with these uh, infrastructure improvements. Um, I would have to get back to you on the particular timing of those, ma'am. Okay, and switching gears to the uh, 2nd Cavalry Regiment that is returning back to the United States, what is the process to determine where their location is going to be of their new home station and what's the timeline for stationing uh, them back to the U.S.? And along with that, what infrastructure will be needed for them to return? So the uh, the, the timeline is uh, will take uh, will take some time. I mean, as we've said consistently, this is uh, months of planning and years of execution. Uh, so that precise timeline is uh, to be determined, and that will be, um, you know, in consultation with uh, obviously with Congress and also the uh, the services on where where they may end up in the United States. So do you have any idea how much uh, infrastructure will need to be uh, built to sustain them, or will that be determined once you determine the location? I assume uh, the latter, ma'am. Okay. Um, thank you very much. I'll yield back. Thank you, uh, Mr. Is Mr. Norcross with us? I don't. Mr. Norcross is he? Uh, no, sir. He is not. Uh, Mr. Gallego. Mr. Gallego is with us remotely. Ruben, uh, you hearing me there? Thank you. Yeah, yeah, I can. Thank you very much. Uh, I, I apologize. I'm still in shock to begin with uh, in regards to the. I'm sorry, can you hear me? Okay. Yes, we can. I guess, like, I'm still in shock to, to, to begin with, like, about the decision making process that we saw uh, going into this. Uh, and that's just kind of wanted to make sure that, that you all understand part of our statement here. Um, many of us attend, a couple of us attended a briefing, classified briefing, that I think a lot of us were very, uh, came out not very satisfied in terms of um, where the rationale and not only where the rationale came from, but then the the method that was used to basically hit the goals that were set by the president. So uh, I just want to stick that out. Uh, so to go into further questions, so General Alvin, have we seen a decrease in Russian military activity or general decrease in the threat from Russia in the past couple of years? Uh, no, Congressman, we haven't. Okay, and, and I agree. Uh, so General Alvin, today, uh, I, I, for, for the NDA, I wrote the amendment in this year's NDA restrictions on troop withdrawals and move to get rid of infrastructure in Europe. So tell me, how to get troops out of Germany or Europe with all well-placed defense against Russian attack, anything other than a, you know, a soft gift, in my opinion, to the Kremlin uh, that's still actively trying to exert its influence over uh, Europe? Well, Congressman, all I can really offer on that front is that as, as we're looking to execute the national defense strategy, we, we take into account not only what Russia is doing, but we also have to take into account what China is doing. We also have to take into account uh, what is happening with respect to our readiness, trying to recover readiness. We also have to take into account the fact that despite uh, the fact that Congress has been uh, very, very generous with the budget, we can anticipate that there will be probably downward pressure on the budget. So as we look at how we can best array the forces to deter across the globe, um, if we were to take Europe in isolation, it, it is a very, uh, very defensible argument to talk about that maybe we should have more forces in Europe. Uh, and at the same time, you, one might say we need to have more forces in the Indo-PACOM AOR to push back on that aggression. But as those sort of conflict with each other, the idea that we would develop a new approach to deterrence, and that approach is founded on dynamic force employment, that in order to do that, some of these, uh, 
these force alignments and these force reposturing enable the secretary to have more freedom to be able to do dynamic force employment to not only um, deter in Europe, but also to deter in the Indo-Pacific. Now that is going to require something though. That is going to require our ability to demonstrate that we can deploy forces in a rapid manner, in a operationally unpredictable manner, in that the new decision calculus, which is the baseline of deterrence, the new decision calculus is based on the idea that even though the forces may not be there in the way that they were before, that malign influence that is being uh, considered is now perhaps deterred because of the idea that the forces will be there in an unpredictable manner, maybe not where they uh, expected they would be, but and it's still the cost and the risk outweighs the benefit of that malign activity. So it really is trying to understand with all those uh, conflicting pressures how one best postures across the globe, which is why, as Dr. Anderson mentioned, the Secretary has directed the combatant command reviews across all of the combatant commands. I don't plan my time. Uh, first of all, thank you, uh, but let, to, make, to be clear, talking to many of our European defense ministers, uh, if we want to talk about deterrence, the best deterrence, obviously, is having a strong alliance that you know trusts each other and believes in each other. Uh, these moves have really made a lot of our longstanding allies question whether our, we're really going to be there should the balloon go up. And speaking of just cost, Dr. Anderson, why hasn't the department sent the committee a cost estimate? Aside from actively harming our national security, in my opinion, we're going to need money to make these changes. Specifically, moving a combat command headquarters like AFRICOM is going to cost us billions of dollars. Where's that money going to come from? What's the estimate for all this stuff? That how much is going to cost? So, as uh, Secretary Esper pointed out on the 29th of July, um, you know we're still formulating those uh, cost estimates. Uh, he he did uh, he did note that it it will be in the. the the single digit uh, billions that that is the rough order of magnitude at, at this point uh, but clearly going forward uh, subject to further planning and uh, assessments uh, we will have a more refined estimate that we will be able to share with the uh, the committee well thank you and uh, dr dark anderson this is just just to be clear we made a uh, decision based on this president's uh, decision to move a certain amount of troops out of germany without any actual context of how this brings deterrence or national security. And then we had basically the Pentagon build a, I would say, a plan around that idea so uh, without any actual understanding. If you could wrap that up quickly, Ruben. So, okay. The gentleman's time ha ha has expired. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Byrne is recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. General, I see that you've got a master's from Troy State. You spent some time at Maxwell Air Force Base. Alabama proudly claims you, so I'm glad you're here. So I'm trying to understand some basics here, and, and I know you can help me. So a total of 12,000 military personnel are being repositioned, and I think I understand that 5,600 of those will be restationed within NATO, but 6,400 will be coming back to the United States. Do I have that correct? That, that approximate number, yes. Are, are, are the 6,400, are all of them on going to be on a rotational basis, or are some of them not going to be on a rotational basis? Uh, to my understanding, uh, that uh, as, as was briefed to the secretary and the secretary uh, released on the 29th, some are, some may be back maintaining readiness as well. So they're so available. When they come back on a rotational basis, are they still considered to be a part of the UCOM force? Yes, Congressman, they are. Okay. So they're part of the UCOM force, but they're in the United States, can be brought back at the pleasure of the commander. How, how, how do they get back? Well, sir, there's a, there's a process that uh, is called the Global Force Management Process that I won't bore the committee with here, but it really, the combatant command, combat commander will request on a rotating basis certain types of forces for certain types of activities and justify it within the context of their global campaign plan and execution of the national defense strategy. That makes its way into the department. The chairman and the Joint Chiefs of Staff as a global integrator will evaluate all of those requests and look at from a global perspective in the execution of national defense strategy, and that will make its way up his uh, military advice up to OSD and up to the secretary for decision. So those rotational forces will be uh, dispersed across the globe in accordance with uh, the national defense strategy priorities. And, th and that happens year to year. But on any given time, if you're counting noses in the theater, I, I think uh, General Walters would say all of those, whether rotational or assigned, those are the forces he considers as part of the U.S. European uh, command force posture. But I, I might make sure I understand what you're saying. Even though they're part of UCOM, they've rotated back to the United States, 
they could be put in the Indo-PACON if that was the decision by the Department of Defense. That's correct, Congressman. Okay. And another unit could actually go into your your right. So it does seem like, even though you're saying it's rotational, it does seem like we've got a net reduction of forces in, in, in country and in, in available to UConn by 6,400. That's the way it seems to somebody that's not in uniform. Where am I wrong about that? Well, you're not wrong. The, the idea is it could be at any time up to 6,400 fewer. However, at any given time, depending on the nature of which rotational forces have been requested and where, it could be no net loss. So, so there still is a, a variability. They are just no longer permanently with their families stationed there. But they could be they or other units, like units or different units, can be there doing the same mission for the combatant commander. But to do that, you've got to go through that process that you described. And I don't know whether that's a process that takes five minutes, five days, five weeks, or five months, but it's, it takes some time to make that decision. Those decisions are made well ahead of time. So, so the decisions are going on right now for the types of forces that will be deployed in, in the end of fiscal year 21 into fiscal year 22. So there, those, those forces are known well ahead enough any time so they can get trained up for the missions for which they have been designated to be allocated to the combatant commander for. Well, I'm certainly not in a position to question someone that has your level of expertise and experience, but from a, a, a layperson's point of view, it looks like we've reduced our troop presence in Europe at a time that Russia is actually becoming more of a threat. And that, that I hope you understand that's where some of us are coming from. We're saying this looks like we're pulling back and we think we should be stepping forward. I never forget, I think it was my second month on this committee that uh, Russia basically invaded the Ukraine and nobody had any notice. We didn't have five months to plan. They just did it. And I have absolutely no confidence that Putin won't do that again. In fact, I have all the confidence in the world he will do it again, particularly if he thinks that we're weakening. And I worry, and I think some of our allies are worrying, that they're looking at this move as a weakening of American presence, a weakening of American resolve, a weakening of American capability operating with our NATO allies. So I'm just registering to you. I don't have your background, and I can't question you on the details of it. But from that sort of outsider's layman's perspective, it looks like we're pulling back. And I think that bothers a lot of us. And with that, Mr. Chairman, I yield back. Thank you very much. So I'm not sure if I'm looking at the screen who we have here. Uh, Ms. Horn is up next. Kendra, are you on anywhere? Does not appear that way. Uh, Mr. Cisneros. Not sure. We were over two. Um, Mr. Crow. I saw you there. There you are, Jason. Uh, Mr. Yeah, Mr. Crow is up. You're at for five minutes. Great. Yes, uh, let we me got start you. with uh, Mr. Anderson. Uh, Mr. Anderson, I was uh, quizzical to say the least uh, on your comment that there are no downsides of rotational forces. So I just want to flat that out for a minute. Uh, one is um, our rotational forces, do they have as much time to train and develop relationships and interoperability? with local uh, NATO partner forces as permanently stationed forces do. So even with the uh, rotational forces, uh, you know, we, we will have a, a, a limited presence uh, within uh, a particular country through which the rotational forces are, are moving. But the forces themselves, they, they don't have less time than if they were permanently stationed, correct? They will have less time within the country. That is okay. Correct. Next question. Next question. Do they have a, as good awareness of the terrain and the surrounding area with which they'll operate as a permanently based force? So again, there will be there will be liaisons. There will be forward. Will the forces elements. themselves? I'm not concerned about the, the liaisons, headquarter people, people sitting back in headquarters offices. The forces themselves. So the forces themselves will have a, uh, I would say, a, a broader per, per, a broader understanding of possible regions of the world that they okay. may have to deploy. So you're saying, Mr. Anderson, you're saying that a rotational force coming from the United States that rotates for six to nine months or a year will have a broader view, uh, but they have, they, they, will they have a greater or less understanding of the terrain with which they would operate in Eastern Europe if they were to be countering Russian aggression? So they will not have the same degree of understanding as, as forces that okay. 
but but they they, Thank they you, will Anderson. retain a, a keen appreciation and a focus. As I will reclaim my time, Mr. Anderson, so they'll have less they'll have less time and less awareness of the train. Secondly, will they have as much time with their families as a permanently stationed force in Europe would have? So it it depends on the nature and the frequency of the rotations. Okay, Mr. Anderson, the answer is no to that, and you know that. Uh, they'll be rotating away from their families. Uh, next is, will they have as much time to train on ranges and critical combat skills? Because if you're forward deploying or rotating, obviously a significant amount of time is spent uh, actually deploying and redeploying. Will they have as much time doing critical combat skill training? So two points, even forces that are permanently, permanently stationed in Europe today deploy within Europe and spend or are apart from their families at certain at certain times. Secondly, for training, uh, it really depends on the, the, the unit that we're talking about and the available ranges. Uh, they it may in some cases actually have greater training and access in the United States, again, depending on the unit. Okay. Well, Mr. Anderson, um, uh, I think you and I both know that um, when you're re to deploying and redeploying forces, that takes significant time that could otherwise be spent on critical combat skills and brings credulity that you would try to justify it that way. And, and there are indeed many downsides to rotational forces in terms of the readiness of our troops. And I believe you know that. Uh, so I, I don't appreciate uh, you dodging those questions. Um, Mr. Anderson, um, the Secretary of the Army, Mr. Uh, McCarthy, Secretary McCarthy, uh, on July 21st confirmed after returning from Europe that he had had no discussions with our European ally, allies about a rebasing or a troop withdrawal as of July 21st. So why would the Secretary of the Army be unaware of this plan at that point, not be consulting with our allies? Uh, I can't speak for the Secretary of the Army. I can, uh, I can assure you, though, that I was in contact with uh, my counterparts uh, at the policy level about this uh, force structure reposturing. Okay, General Alvin, turning to you for a moment. Uh, you've been in the military for a very long time and have been a part of a lot of discussions around repositioning and uh, shifting of forces. Uh, did the, the timeline uh, and the process for this decision, uh, was that consistent with the prior timelines and processes that you followed in the past? Congressman, I would say that uh, given the timeline when the Secretary directed the combatant command to do this, which was starting in January, uh, I would say that this is uh, this is not completely inconsistent. I would say that the complexity of this uh, also is the re reason why the secretary has reserved the right to continue to make iterations as we get smarter. But uh, it, this is a six-month review is consistent, uh, and I think the the devil will be in the details of the up, up the updates to it and the implementation in order to make sure we measure twice and cut once. Okay, thank you, General. Uh, Chairman, I yield back. Thank you very much. Um, Mr. Conaway is recognized for five minutes. Well, thanks, Chairman. Uh, gentlemen, thank you. Um, nobody likes to have their decisions second guess, but that's the drill. So appreciate you being here this morning. Um, I'm a CPA, and, and I kind of approach everything from the dollar standpoint. Uh, Dr. Anderson, did I hear you say earlier that there was a rigorous cost benefit analysis done on the overall project of, of what was what we proposed in June. In other words, it's going to cost more money, less money. Uh, DOD budgets are always under pressure, given the tyranny of personnel costs constantly increasing. So, what's the what's the bottom line? Is it going to cost us more or less? So we we anticipate that uh, uh, this, in, in its totality, will, uh, as a rough order of magnitude, cost in the in the single digit billions. That is the uh, the estimate at this time. And as we go forward and refine those estimates. Um, it, that number may go go up, uh, or w w could be adjusted in some. Well, I understand it, it would change if you change your plan, but would you describe the process as being rigorous? So, as, as uh, or the back noted, of a napkin uh, seemed like uh, earlier, and as my colleague has has uh, pointed out, uh, we are we're still in the process of uh, developing and maturing this plan. And there, it, it is a complex one. There are a lot of a uh, lot of moving pieces here, uh, different headquarters going different places, and rotational forces, and uh, subject to further refinement. So we we just do not have a so a clear could you could you anticipate a, a decision that we can't afford to do all of this and we unwind this? 
if it costs too much money? Or is cost not a factor? So this is something obviously it's going to be a, we're going to have to, we, we, we will need congressional support obviously for any authorization or, or appropriations. Um, I, it's my view that notwithstanding the, the pressure on the budget that this is something that uh, we will be able to afford and, uh, and, and the costs will be spaced out over time. Yeah. Dr. Anderson, I, that I would prefer you to have said I've got a rigorous analysis and that to come to that conclusion. I know that's what you want it to be, but uh, let me ask you this, and this is just a bit of a real weird uh, observation. In your testimony, you said the third leg would be to move 2,500 airmen from Royal Air Force Base Minute Hall to, to Germany, uh, was planned to move to Germany, and that you're not going to do that. Um, is there a, a plan someplace in the bowels of the department that uh, when that original decision was to move those air units, the air refueling and special ops, move them to Germany, was there some sort of a justification plan that uh, was done at that point in time that would have had some lofty phrases as to why you made why that made sense? And now we're unwinding that decision. And the only rationale you put in your statement is that uh, they would remain in the UK, thus ensuring uninterrupted readiness and responsive of these responsiveness of these units. That leads me to believe that if we'd have gone through with a move to Germany, that it would have, in fact, interrupted their readiness and responsiveness. That's not what you're telling us, is it? So I'm, I'm whatever the justification of for initially having the plan to move them to Germany, I'm not, uh, I'm not familiar with that. That, I believe, precedes my time uh, in my in my current position. Uh, but what I what I what we do know is that uh, in order to meet the, uh, the the cap of the reduction in Germany, uh, this was a, okay. This so this move this, was dri events. this wasn't driven by a mission. This was driven by the caps. Well, there's a cap, and there's also the the, the added benefit, as pointed out in the statement, that there are uh, efficiencies to you know, remaining in with our close uh, uh, British. So how much money was spent in Germany on the receiving base before we unwound this decision? Um, I, I don't have that detail, sir. I'd have to come back to you on that. You have any idea when that decision was made to move that unit, those 2,500 airmen, and I assume their families, to Germany? Would we have been spending money at the receiving base in Germany at this point, by, oh, during that time frame? I, I will have to take that for the record and come back okay. to you on the time. If you wouldn't mind doing that, I'd appreciate it. Hey, you're back, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. And I, I do just have to make the comment, and I, I know you gentlemen are doing the job that's assigned you by the Pentagon. This is why we need an actual undersecretary for policy, and this is why we need the positions that the Pentagon filled. I understand, Dr. Anderson, you, you're in a difficult position. You weren't here for the plans. You're in an acting position now. Um, but there's a level of detail in a bipartisan way. This is just not acceptable from the Department of Defense, that you know, on a move of this kind, you know, whatever you guys may think of Congress, whatever you may think of this committee, it is our responsibility to exercise oversight this. The American people and in their infinite wisdom have put us in these chairs. Um, and we are not getting the level of insight in this decision that we should. And I don't know if it's because you're in an acting position, acting in the role of or whatever, but I wasn't in on that, I didn't hear that, I'd have to talk to this person, I'd have to talk to that person. You know, and again, you're, you're doing what the Pentagon told you to do and I'm not taking this out on you. But for the Pentagon to send this over on a decision of this level and not, Dale said, look, here's what we did, here's the timeline, here's the piece we talked to, we talked to this person, we didn't talk to that person. I mean, the level of detail that we're getting here is just not acceptable for, for, for us to exercise our oversight and for what the Pentagon should be putting in front of us. And I just, I just want that on the record from, from my perspective. And I, I have the strong sense that my colleagues on both sides of the aisle would agree with me on, on that point. So on this and other decisions, we, we just need to hear better what the hell's going on um, so that we can exercise our oversight. And I'm, if you have a comment on that, you're, you're, you're welcome to. But that is, it is a very frustrating briefing at this point. So uh, Congressman, it's, it's, it's clearly not the case that we are not providing the details, but we just, at this stage of the process, we don't have that level of detail. But we commit as the plan matures and we develop those details that we will we will we will share them with the committee. That that that's alarming in its own right. Um, but 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 I, I take your point. Um, okay. Next up, we have Miss Davis, recognized for five minutes. 
Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you uh, for, for being here. You're obviously doing your job. We totally understand that. Um, but I, I am taken back as well um, by the language uh, that you're developing and maturing the plan. Uh, when do you think the plan is going to be matured? So I, I would anticipate that uh, uh, you know, by early uh, 2021, early in the new year, that we will have a, a much more mature plan to, uh, to share with Congress. And General Alvin, did you want to respond to that as well? Is that your time frame? I don't have any better answer than that. Uh -huh. Quite frankly, a lot of it will, will depend upon what Dr. Anderson has spoken about, all of the variables that need to come together. But um, to, to get the, as the chairman said, to get the details that would be satisfying, I, I would imagine would be into yeah. that time frame. And I wonder, Dr. Anderson, of the details that you're talking about, what is it that concerns you the most that you don't have a feel for, that you don't feel is, is, is um, cooked? So from a, from a policy perspective, I'm, I'm very comfortable with this plan. And in fact, I, I think it is going to serve the interests of the national defense strategy uh, that we, uh, we, uh, we promulgated in uh, January 2018. Uh, so I, I, at that level, uh, I'm very, uh, uh, very pleased with the approach. I think it is going to uh, enhance deterrence and assure allies and provide us more flexibility. Um, I, you know, I, I, I too am interested in the, in the cost details. Uh, cost is, uh, you know, as we think about budgets in the future, obviously a large concern. Um, so that is something that uh, we'll certainly be keeping an eye on. Okay. Th thank you. I, I know that in, in the testimony that you all presented, you, you pointed to uh, airmen that had been scheduled to rebase to Germany and that they would remain in the UK. And you said that they would do so uh, to ensure that the un un interrupted readiness and responsiveness of these units would, would be realized. Um, I'm wondering about other units that have been designated to be moved experiencing an interruption in their readiness and responsiveness. What can we expect on that level? So there will be a, a timing and a, a phasing and a sequencing of uh, all these moves. Uh, I can say uh, with confidence they're not, they're not going to all happen at once. They'll be spaced out over time. Uh, and because of that, we will be uh, very attuned to any uh, temporary uh, disruption or uh, interruptions in, uh, in, in readiness or uh, capabilities. And you'll be planning for that? Yes, indeed. And I okay. would also note in the broader sweep of NATO's history, we've made uh, moves, even larger moves, and we have, uh, we have done so without compromising our overall capabilities Thank or, or readiness. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Um, General Alvin, you, you mentioned, you did mention the families, and we know how critical and how important they, that is. Um, the men and women who serve our country uh, have a vote in this, um, and they, they do it often by their feet. And so I wonder um, what you're doing to mitigate the impact on those families and what cost do you incur as you attempt to realign them? Congressman, primarily the, the one of the five that the secretary laid out was to take care of the service members and the families. And I think that goes to uh, largely the, uh, the idea of planning this out ahead of time to be able to ensure that when the move happens, and of course, as you mentioned, ma'am, the, the, the service members and the families, they have to be resilient because they move here and there and everywhere. That's a part of life, but we don't need to make it more complicated. So the idea that as the moves are being contemplated, uh, the department ensures, and the chairman is very uh, engaged on this as well, that the landing location, wherever that will be, when these moves happen, uh, will be in you know, full consultation with the services who are responsible for the organized training equipped to provide them the combatant commands, as well as this body and others to ensure that, as I said before, measure twice, cut once. Mm -hmm. So we won't. Do you have a sense that it's really important to surge personnel in order to address the needs of families, often uh, families feel that uh, it takes forever for them to get the attention that they need in order to, to plan themselves for a move that can be detrimental in terms of the education of their children uh, and many other facets uh, of this. What will be done to bring on more personnel in order to address it? First of all, Congresswoman, I would say the way you put it is, is very eloquent and very accurate. Uh, I anticipate that the chairman will work with the Joint Chiefs as well as the service in their hats as service chiefs to ensure that as those moves which are executed by the services, 
that they are doing that, as you said, surge the personnel to where you're able to communicate what's required and how they can anticipate that so they'll at least have some predictability. Thank you, sir. My time is up. Thank you, Mr. Bacon. It's recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I first want to just start off by congratulate, congratulating General Alvin. Uh, I've had multiple assignments with him, and for him to be getting his fourth star, uh, the Air Force is uh, selecting the right person. So congratulations to you. And we've had a little bit of a debate up here on the forward presence of forces, and I believe that we absolutely need forward presence in Poland and the Baltics. We've seen in the past with Georgia and Ukraine how Russia responds to perceived weakness. So I, I'm a, a, a big supporter of making sure we have a presence. I would even prefer a per permanent presence in Poland and the Baltics to make our intentions and our deterrence clear. And my first question is to Dr. Anderson, if I may. I used to be the commander at Ramstein. I was the deputy at Third Air Force. What's our plans for Spangdalem in the long run? Because I believe both Spangdalem and Ramstein are strategic bases that we have to preserve because of the airlift capacity. The airlift capacity cannot go strictly on Ramstein. We know that. And it's in the perfect spot for unair refueled C-17s that get there and then get to the Middle East or, or Africa. And without Spangdalem, we're, I think we're in trouble. So I'm just curious your perspective. So certainly in the, in the context of moving to greater rotational forces, there's still a role for, uh, for hubs, uh, logistics hubs and, uh, and, and air bases um, that, uh, that can and, and should be retained. So I, I would, uh, ex that, that is part of our, our thinking on the uh, European force structure reposturing. So your intentions to maintain Spangdalem as an airlift hub? So, um, I, I know that we're, we're going to retain the hubs. I, I, I want to be a little bit, uh, uh, I want to caveat this a little bit because I'm, I'm not familiar with the, the exact nature of, uh, of what's, what's being planned for that particular base. Now, just let me put my perspective out there. That whole capacity can't fall on Ramstein. I know it, or I just know it firsthand. And both those bases are your primary conduits in the Middle East and Africa and would be for the rest of Europe if you had troubles in Poland or the Baltics. So I just, I just I wor I'm worried about pulling out of Spangdalem total. I could see some force realignment, but that airlift hub is critical. Yes, and our defense planners are fully aware of those, uh, uh, those, those advantages. Yes, sir. Uh, another question, I, I always was concerned about pulling out of Mildenhall. The United Kingdom, Great Britain's our best ally in NATO. Through thick and thin, they've been with us. I didn't really care for how we handled that to begin with, so I'm glad that we're maintaining force presence at Mildenhall. Uh, what's the plan for Fairford? Because we were talking about moving the RC-135s there. So I'm not, uh, I'm not sure. I, I don't know if my colleague is uh, mm -hmm. aware of the, the particulars on that. Congressman, I will take that for the record because <laughs> I think that uh, having experienced uh, Europe as, as you have as well, you understand that. And so I will, um, in the context of what uh, General Walters is currently pursuing, uh, we will get, we'll take that for the record and get back to you. But I, to your point on Mildenhall, as you recall, that it was a European infrastructure consolidation which was made in a different time. And so Mildenhall, while not only serving as a refueling, can also help augment that critical through flow for enabling global mm -hmm. operations as an airlift hub as well. Can help to augment those two bases you mentioned in Germany, sir. Let me just uh, plant this thought too. We have built a strong relationship with Great Britain when it comes to reconnaissance. Uh, we have sold them RC-135s. We, we operate out of there. I think it would be wise to have a joint base with the UK and ourselves doing the RC-135 operations. You get great synergy, and uh, we both and we both gain from it. It's a win-win. So I, I I'm a proponent for it. And let me just close on this. I'm a little concerned about where we're going with Germany. I think we have a growing rift. They used to be on the front lines, you know, obviously in the Cold War, but now they're more of the logistics hub. And I'm concerned that we're burning bridges with the, the populace and the political leadership there with a country that we absolutely have to have a good rapport with if we have a, strong, <clears throat> a conflict with Russia down the road. Are we a threat of burning bridges too far with Germany? Because it, it, that should be a concern to us. Now, I defer to you, Dr. Anderson. Well, a couple of points. I mean, Germany certainly plays a constructive role. They've, they've been helpful in uh, in, uh, in Afghanistan and in Iraq, and uh, also been a, an outstanding uh, partner in uh, counterterrorism activities. 
Um, all that said, the, uh, the the president and the secretary are, are absolutely right in uh, in asserting that that Germany can and should pay more in terms of its uh, defense budget. Uh, there, the Wales pledge was agreed to unanimous, unanimously in 2014 uh, to get to two percent within 10 years, and, and Germany is currently lagging at about uh, one and a half percent. They have. They, they do have a plan to get to 2%, but that's not going to happen by, by their terms by uh, 2030. So we would uh, certainly encourage uh, Berlin to, uh, to advance that timeline. So, Mr. Chair, I'll just close with this, that they are paying under 2%, but we still need them to have a strong alliance. So we've got to find a way to make that work. And I'll just say, hey, we're going to have a great vice chief of staff. G gentlemen, uh, yeah. gentlemen's time has expired. Uh, Mr. Garamendi is recognized for five minutes. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I think we lost you there, John. Are you still I with us? I am more and more convinced. I am. It should be, uh, should be there. Yeah, keep going. Yeah, if you're speaking, we can no longer hear you. <laughs> Appreciate that helpful insight. Um, yeah, I'm sorry, John. We, we've got a connection problem here because we, we, are, we are not hearing you. You're moving stiltedly. So we'll see if we can fix that. In the meantime, I have, I don't see him on the screen, though. Um, uh, Mr. Cisneros is the next one who is up. Mr. Cisneros, you are recognized for five minutes if your um, device functions. Go ahead. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Appreciate that. Um, and, uh, thanks to our panel for being here today. And I, I know this has been asked, um, but I will kind of ask it again. But based on Secretary Esper's comments, uh, this realignment will be expensive, not to mention the impact of realignment on morale for our service members and their families. Uh, does the department expect any savings or increased burden sharing contributions from Germany as a result of the realignment that would compensate for the cost of the proposed force posture changes. Uh, General Alvin, uh, what is the plan for the military families of U.S. service members who are affected by this realignment? So let, let me uh, start with the, the question on Germany. Uh, you know, certainly it is our it is it is our hope and it is is our indeed our expectation that uh, Germany will live up to the uh, the Wales pledge. Uh, going forward, and I would say even more broadly with respect to this uh, uh, realignment plan for European force structure, uh, we will look for opportunities where our, our allies can uh, contribute and, uh, in, in, in terms of the funding element of, of this, uh, because this, is a, this does need to be a, a shared burden. Um, with respect to the, uh, the families, and uh, I'll ask my counterpart to uh, elaborate, but, but certainly this ties in directly with uh, Secretary Esper's uh, commitment that he stated on numerous occasions that we are going to take care of our service members and our, our families uh, throughout this entire process. Uh, and what that means in very practical terms is that as the, uh, as the plan matures and we have timelines that we will uh, keep them informed. Um, and I would also note that there are no, there are no near term by that in the next couple months uh, PCS moves that are, uh, are currently envisioned. All that will be uh, scoped out and uh, uh, communicated appropriately. And Congressman, I'll follow up uh, with what uh, Dr. Anderson mentioned. Uh, the, the plan really for the families is, is as I uh, mentioned when I was speaking with Representative Davis, the understanding the scope and the ultimate destination, which has to be, has to be 100% in consultation with this body as well as the services. The services who will eventually, uh, they are the ones who do the organized training and equip, they uh, will be part and parcel of understanding uh, that particular puzzle and, and the right location uh, for those service members and families to go who, who will be uh, uh, rotated back. But as Representative Davis said, I, I feel very confident that I can speak on behalf of the services on this to say that surging ahead of time, surging the people to ensure that the families are made well aware uh, and have a predictability, because that's, we understand families need to be resilient. The, the best that we can do on this is to give them the predictability so they aren't uh, sort of whiplashing around between one eventuality and the next. 
All right, thank you. Uh, so, Mr. Anderson, um, you know, there's talk about moving an F-16 squadron to Italy from Germany, uh, also uh, moving 2,000 troops uh, to Belgium. Uh, but yet, you know, Belgium nor Italy meet NATO's target for defense spending, uh, which seems to be inconsistent with the administration's reasoning um, with moving these troops out. So, what? How can you speak towards the inconsistency of of moving the president? Well, the comments that the president's made that Germany is uh, is not uh, paid its dues and not doing its part. So he's moving troops out, but yet we're moving troops into other areas. Uh, of NATO that have also been not kind of met their their part as well as uh, their financial obligation. So in the in the formulation of the uh, of, of the concept, which is transitioning to a plan, um, the defense planners did not uh, you know look at a scorecard of of, of who's paying what um, as a determining factor on where rotational units would go. They they made these. Uh, assessments based upon uh, their best military judgment uh, and what makes sense uh, operationally uh, in terms of the, the broader uh, restructuring, restructuring. All right, so this is, so the president, you know, his delinquent, his comment about delinquent and they haven't paid their NATO fees. Um, this is not the reason we're not punishing Germany for moving these troops out. So uh, again, going back to a, an earlier point, uh, you know, UCOM has been thinking about force posture moves uh, on, on a continuous basis, and then receives specific direction from Secretary Esper in uh, in the January February timeframe, and uh, and it's it's fair to say that the president's guidance did uh, accelerate the process, uh, and, and has brought us uh, to this point where we are we are sharing the the concept. Thank you, gentlemen's time has expired. Miss um, Gabbard is next and is recognized for five minutes. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman, and uh, thank you to the witnesses here. Uh, I know uh, earlier you briefly touched on um, impacts to AFRICOM, but I'm wondering if you can go into a little bit more detail, both on where AFRICOM missions will pull their forces from with this change, given they share troops uh, with with the Europe uh, AOR, and also how will this change impact um, any int intel gathering capabilities or other shared capabilities that currently exist between the two commands? So with respect to uh, AFRICOM, ma'am, uh, there too, uh, the department is undergoing a uh, combatant command a blank slate review of uh, missions and tasks and and uh, and deployments, and that uh, that is currently uh, ongoing. Um, and when uh, Secretary Esper makes uh, final decisions uh, with respect to uh, the positioning of those forces, uh, we will uh, we will share those appropriately. Uh, with respect to uh, uh, intelligence and warning, uh, certainly agree with the. Uh, uh, the point or the importance uh, of that on uh, on multiple fronts, uh, to include going back to our earlier discussion about uh, moving rotational forces uh, to the European content, continent and, and back to the United States. Uh, it's uh, absolutely imperative that we have uh, appropriate uh, intelligence and surveillance that will provide us uh, sufficient indications and warning time in order to make these moves. And forgive me if you uh, already s talked about this, I, I didn't hear it, but um, how will this uh, new realignment impact the, the burden sharing contributions that come from Germany um, and, and how that will impact them as well as how it will impact us? So moving forward uh, on this uh, on this realignment, we will look we will look for opportunities where uh, allies can uh, contribute. Um, you know, financially in a, in a meaningful way. Um, you know, some of those costs will obviously be ours, but we will look for those opportunities. And I, then I would say more broadly, uh, we, uh, we continue to uh, expect our, our European allies to, to live up and to fulfill the uh, Wales Pledge that was unanimously agreed to in uh, 2014. Uh, I would also say on the uh, on the cost front and the financial front that uh, we 
well, NATO has made progress. There are more countries now that uh, are at or above the 2% um, limit. Uh, those include not only, uh, of course, ourselves, the United States, uh, but Bulgaria, Greece, United Kingdom, Estonia, Romania, Lithuania, uh, Latvia, and also Poland. And uh, there are some other countries that soon will be at that 2% level. So uh, that is a positive trajectory. So, so specifically with Germany, I mean, you, you have a very specific number of troops that will be repositioned back here in the United States. Um, are you not able to speak specifically to how that burden sharing uh, agreement will be impacted both Germany and the United States because it has to be renegotiated or you, you don't know? Well, with respect to the uh, the, the target for uh, defense spending, the uh, uh, you know, the Germany, as with the other NATO partners, is uh, is expected to reach the two percent, and they um, they they have articulated that they can get there in 2030. Uh, it is our position that they uh, can and they should move that timeline uh, much earlier to to get to two percent. And I would also say that it's uh, you know we we talk about the two percent level all the time and and for the appropriate reasons. But there's also the uh, um, you know we we have to focus on not just the number but what what are actually the capabilities. And there it's. Uh, you know, there is a 20% target of uh, defense spending that would be uh, invested in, in, in actual, uh, no kidding, uh, military capabilities. Okay, thank you, Mr. Chairman. He'll back. Thank you, Ms. Torres Small is recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And thank you both so much for being here. I really appreciate your service to our country. Uh, acting Under Secretary Anderson, I wanted to follow up on the conversation that you had with Congress members Wilson and Houlihan uh, about AFRICOM headquarters. Um, and, and really appreciate your conversation that you mentioning the factors that you would discuss, that you would review. So you mentioned cost and receptivity of the host nation as factors for consideration in the relocation. Will you also consider time zone? I think. Uh, uh, I'm not sure how, uh, I don't think that would be a, a big consideration, ma'am. Okay, in terms of ease of communication and yeah. coordination. I mean, we, we have now, we have uh, certain, obviously we have combat commands that are in different time zones. So, uh, and uh, you know, both uh, General Alvin and myself, we, we just manage that, right? Sometimes we have uh, late night calls or early morning calls, depending on which combat command we're talking about. Um, I, I do not see that as a, uh, a, a big issue in the considerations. Okay, what about proximity to the continent? So um, there, again, I, I don't want to get beyond the, the, the three broad possible uh, uh, destinations, whether it be in the European continent or in Africa or, uh, or the United States. They, they, they all have particular advantages and disadvantages that need to be sorted out. Well, and part of making that decision, pro making that decision is identifying all of those advantages and disadvantages, correct? Yes. So would you consider as one of those advantages or disadvantages proximity to the continent? To, uh, to, the to, to, uh, it, that, that is among the other, uh, the other, uh, among the considerations. Yes, ma'am. Okay. And are there any other considerations that you think are important for determining the headquarters for Africom? Um, I think uh, the ones that we've talked about are the, are the main ones. So in your response to Congre Congresswoman Houlihan, you committed to ensuring that the decision would ma be made in consultation with Congress. And I deeply appreciate that and also appreciate you reaffirming that for Chairman Smith and Congresswoman Davis regarding the entire realignment. In regards to AFRICOM headquarters, will you commit to ensuring that DOD provides an assessment of all the factors we just identified and present them to this committee in advance of that determination? Yes, we, I commit to that. Thank you. I, I appreciate that because it is deeply important. These are vital decisions that affect our deterrence posture, our relationship with allies, and all of our national security. Do you agree with that? Uh, yes, the committee obviously has a tremendous role to play in this process. Thank you very much. Uh, I wonder then why the decision was made to move AFRICOM headquarters in the first place without such consultation. Mm -hmm. So uh, part of that, as, uh, as, as mentioned previously in the discussion, is to, uh, is to seek operational efficiencies um, and also to, uh, to meet the, uh, the directed cap of uh, the reductions regarding uh, you know, Germany. Would consultation with Congress have impacted that? Um, 
I'm not sure if it would or would not have in, impacted that. So what is the difference between now as we identify the future location and the importance of consultation with Congress at that point compared to the decision to relocate it in the first place? So uh, as for the, the, the actual uh, the consideration that came up, that the UCOM staff came up with, I, I cannot speak that directly. Uh, I can say that you know, we, we, are, we are on a bit, have been on a bit of an accelerated timeline. Uh, but now we're, we're in a different place, and as the plan matures, uh, as you've heard, uh, we, we absolutely will, will, will consult with Congress as this plan matures. So there is no articulable distinction between the need for consultation to move headquarters in the first place and the final location. Both are, are important decisions that Congress should be part of and consulted about. And we have, uh, we have brief members and staff members on, on these, uh, these proposed uh, moves. Thank you. I yield the remainder of my time. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Keating, are you with us? Yes, I am, Mr. Chairman. You are recognized uh, for five minutes. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Anderson, uh, you said, quote, unquote, that the decision with uh, removing uh, the nearly 12,000 troops in Germany was a quote unquote, presidential decision. Then you went on with your testimony to talk about uh, the fact that Secretary Esper has been doing a review of rotations in Europe. Now, I want to, it's important for this committee and our relationship and our decision making to understand the joinder of the two things, because you didn't connect them one way or the other. I want to ask you specifically, was that review by Secretary Esper then uh, made concrete and did he place that on the president's desk? for a decision, or did the president make that decision uh, and then inform Secretary Esper? Which way was it? So, Congressman, I'm not privy to uh, discussions between uh, the president well, and the secretary, roughly, so I can't comment on that. I want to I echo what the chairman said. Then why are you here? Uh, this committee deserves answers. To, that's critical to our decision making. In fact, there were about four or five days between the time that Germany informed the president, the Chancellor Merkel informed the president that she's likely not attending the G7 summit when this was announced. Do you think that's a coincidence, a mere coincidence? Or more importantly, since you may not know the answer to that, don't you think that creates uh, a tension and a problem with a, one of our central members of one of our central alliances for our security? Don't you see the appearance of that? So I would say, as articulated very clearly in our national defense strategy, line of effort two, we are committed to our allies and partners. I, I, I know that. To answer the question, don't you understand the, the problem with that appearance? Yes or no? The, the problem answer with the which question, Congressman. Please. I'm sorry? Um, if I could translate, the, the question basically yeah. is the, the appearance of Okay, Germany doesn't come to the G7 summit, which the president doesn't like. A couple days later, the president announces that he's pulling 12,000 troops out of Germany. It appeared to be a petulant response to something he didn't like that Germany did. And I guess the question, sorry, Bill, I'll give you more time, uh, would, would be twofold, would be one, um, doesn't that appearance look bad? And two, what did the department do to try to make sure that that appearance didn't create the obvious problem? Well, sometimes after the fact is not because of the fact. And I, I would note uh, historically, for example, that in 2004, uh, the Bush administration uh, decided to remove 30,000 troops uh, from the European theater, and uh, including a, 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 a lot of those from Germany. Um, and at the time, that was there was a lot of speculation that that was because Germany did not did not support us in the in the Gulf War, um, and uh, that. I, I would argue, Claim my time. So, you know, I, I, I can only speak to the uh, the plan and the the connection to the uh, NDS, and 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 that is uh, uh, there is a very uh, there is a very positive relationship there. This will improve our security. Mr. Chairman, can I reclaim my time and just follow up? Yes, yes, go ahead. So it is it is awkward with the, with the back and forth on the video, but yes, M Mr. Keating, please proceed. Now, you also said that Secretary Esper's plan had involved a lot of strategy with rotation to make sure. One of the things you cited in your testimony was 
the deterrence to Russia and the importance of that. And clearly, we all agree, both everyone in this committee agrees with that. Uh, but at the same time, the president interceded at, with cutting half a billion dollars extra out of the uh, national, out of the uh, European Deterrence Initiative, which was consistent in line with our national defense strategy. Now, how does that make sense? And again, was that the president's decision or was that part of Secretary Esper's strategic plan? Because it's in contradiction with Secretary Esper's strategic plan to be making those cuts and using them to paint the wall at the border black, half a billion dollars. Now tell me where the consistency of that is and who made that decision? Was that part of a strategic decision by the secretary? So with respect to the uh, European uh, Deterrence Initiative, uh, there, there have been a number of uh, military infrastructure projects that have come to uh, completion. Uh, and because of that, the, uh, the, uh, the budget request has been, uh, is, there's a slight, uh, a slight decrease in that, uh, in that funding level. Uh, but we're, we're very confident that the, uh, the funding level is, uh, is indeed a appropriate and that uh, EDI is consistent with uh, in, in, in is, will be complementary to the uh, proposed force structure. Uh, I would say I'm closing. Envisions, a lot envisions here. Envisions here. Include saying, I'll tell you what isn't consistent. What isn't consistent, given even past relationships with this committee uh, and our defense uh, and our uh, secretariat uh, and indeed administrations, what's not consistent is getting a straight answer to questions and, and, and circumventing the will of this committee and Congress. I yield back. Mr. Garamendi wants to give it another shot. Um, so we will, we, we, we will try that. Um, John, you're on again. Well, here I am, hopefully it'll work. I'm gonna make this very, very short. This hearing has been extremely important and very important. no justification for what is being proposed here. Uh, this whole thing started as uh, Mr. Keating said in his comment. Yeah. And with our six months later, with the entire Department of Defense trying to figure out how to make it happen. Bottom line is, it makes no sense whatsoever. Not from beginning to end, and we can go on for several days about that. Bottom line is, in the National Defense Authorization Act, we simply have to stop this. How do I hear you? Stop this foolishness. I'll yield back at this point. Thank, thank you, John. I appreciate that. Um, Mr. Brown is up next. Anthony, Anthony is with us. Go ahead. Yes, thank, thank you, Mr. Chairman. And uh, I uh, want to thank uh, my colleagues on the uh, committee on both sides of the aisle for their you know, comprehensive set of uh, questions, and I too am uh, disappointed with the um, incompleteness and, in some cases, the shallowness of the responses. Uh, nevertheless, most of my questions have been asked, so let me ask uh, about some specific uh, issues. Uh, and both of my questions go to General Alden. Um, as part of the realignment plan, um, Air Force F 16 fighters. Are, the proposal is to shift them from Germany to Italy. Secretary Esper has stated, uh, as many have commented today, that the changes uh, are not meant as a punishment to Germany, but are part of an effort to, quote, strengthen the North Atlantic Treaty Organization, enhance the deterrence uh, of Russia. So my question is, how does a move of F-16s um, southeast uh, in a distance of less than 400 kilometers, improve efforts to deter Russian aggression. What is the cost of moving the F-16s uh, down to Aviano, and will updates need be made uh, to the bases uh, and the hangars and other facilities to house these additional aircraft? Congressman, I'll uh, address the, the, the last two first, and then again, those cost estimates are, are ongoing uh, I don't have the answer to that, and I know if we go back to UCOM, they haven't finalized those cost estimates to this point. To the question of what good does it do to move uh, Air Force fighters from Germany to Italy, 
Um, I'm quoting General Walters now, I believe in some of his earlier uh, responses, is the idea is you're sort of broadening the attack surface, really that the idea that Russia is just um, um, inclined to do things in the Baltic region um, because that's where we sort of strengthened up. I think they're, they have um, perhaps designs for malign influence uh, throughout the periphery. And so Southeast Europe uh, becomes as important as, so the Black Sea becomes as important as the Baltic Sea. And the idea that we would expand down into Italy uh, and, and enhance that ability in Aviano to be able to better address some of the things that are happening in the Eastern Mediterranean and the Black Sea as well. Uh, it really, it, it puts another axis of approach uh, for the UCOM commander. And that was why uh, General Walters uh, opted for that particular piece of the overall plan. Well, I, I appreciate that. I do appreciate that uh, rationale and explanation. Uh, the, the second question I had, again, a very specific question, uh, the Seventh Army Training Command in Grafenbeer, uh, and that, as you know, is is a very large training facility, 233 uh, square kilometers used by both U.S. and NATO uh, allies uh, for major uh, training exercises, um, um, field artillery um, 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 exercises, uh, large armor exercises. Is there any uh, intention to um, uh, close Grafenbeer? Uh, are there intentions to open additional uh, major training centers anywhere else in Europe? Congressman, that's a very important question. To my knowledge, there is not any uh, plans to close it, but I will take that for the record because your, your point is well taken about the capabilities there. And we'll take that for the record and get back to At this point, my understanding of it, there is not uh, a plan to close that important training facility, but I, I owe you a, a more complete answer, sir. And let me just finish then with this sort of statement. You know, we've heard a lot about dynamic force employment today, uh, and we find that in the national defense strategy. Uh, that's a concept that deals, as I understand, with operational uh, deployment to eliminate predictability. Uh, and I, I get a sense that we're using it in today's hearing interchangeably uh, and perhaps inappropriately with uh, rotational force uh, presence. Uh, we have a we have a strategic commitment to NATO to be present in Europe. Either it's rotational or it's permanent. But in many ways, it's predictable because rotational force deploy uh, force uh, uh, deployments or presence is heel to toe. So I'm not quite clear on how going to a more rotational force presence in Europe um, maintains our commitment to our strategic presence uh, in Europe. And um, you don't have time to really respond. If you could take that for the record and just tell me how we're accomplishing dynamic force employment at the same time as rotational force presence in Europe. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I yield back. Thank you. I have Mr. Brindisi on the list here. I don't see him on the screen anymore. And Ms. Slotkin, is she up there somewhere? Or she's... Okay. Um... I'm sorry. So, Mr. Gold and Ms. Trahan, they're not up there either? Okay. Um, Ms. Escobar, you're not on the list, but you are here. Um, did, did you, if you wish, you may, um, I yield five minutes to you. Let's do that. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and um, many thanks to our witnesses. I'd like to join in the chorus of voices um, that on a bipartisan basis, have expressed disappointment at the lack of detail during this hearing today. Um, but I do appreciate that you are here. Lieutenant General Alvin, um, I have some questions for you. I wanna drill down just a little bit more on the, the question of um, sort of cost benefit analysis, which began with, with the chairman's initial question. What impacts do you foresee the realignment having on the Army's limited MFGI sites like Fort Bliss? I represent uh, Congressional District 16 in Texas, um, so obviously there is a, a direct concern for me on that front. And ma'am, I do have to start with that. I am not familiar with that. So I will, that is one we'll take for the record because I am not site swiper or anything. I am not familiar enough to give you a complete answer on the service impacts of the concept. 
Okay. So also to be taken back and, and hopefully to, so, so that we can learn a little bit more as you learn a little bit more about this. Uh, one of the concerns that, that we have uh, or that my office has and that we've expressed uh, to different parties through leadership is that the, there are current infrastructure limitations um, that prevent units from meeting Army standards for efficiently deploying uh, an armored brig brigade combat team. And so I'd like for you to please look into that as well and, and get back to me when possible. Um, and then would also like to learn more about whether there would be infrastructure improvements that could be made in order to ad address those deficiencies that, you know, that we may see this domino effect um, down the line. So, so would like to hear back on that. And then just want to say finally, 11,900 troops strikes me as a significant cut to the force in the region. How do you expect this to impact operations? What will we have to sacrifice? Uh, so ma'am, to be clear, I understand uh, by saying this, I don't want to diminish uh, the point that you make. Uh, but in fact, uh, the 11,900 in the current concept aren't all leaving the region. So there'll be about half those that will come out. Half of those will be better dispersed for the region. But your point is, is still a valid one in understanding uh, how it will affect our approach uh, to the region. And I think that gets to the point of understanding how we will execute the rotational forces and, and uh, to the point by uh, Representative Escobar, I believe, on the um, difference between dynamic force employment and rotational forces. It, this really does, um, is at, at the heart of trying to institute this new approach to deterrence because the, the, the current understanding of deterrence being present, you gotta be present there, that is a way to impact uh, adversary decision calculus on when they're anticipating whether they have a cost-benefit analysis of, of you know, proceeding with malign behavior. But the idea that if we're trying to do this in accordance with the national defense strategy with the myriad threats and adversaries that are emerging across the globe, uh, the services cannot maintain readiness and have all those forces for. So to try and bridge that gap is this new concept. The idea would be through the operational unpredictability and the continued episodic presence to be able to put doubt in the mind of an adversary who might be considering malign behavior. That you know, deterrence is, is, in, is decision calculus. Decision calculus based on perception. Perception is based on experience. So we're trying to change the experience that will still have the same perception that we'll have on, on the calculus. So this is arguably uh, a, a new approach to deterrence rather than just a forward presence. So the idea would be to manage the risk throughout that transition in order to be able to have this idea of dynamic force employment yield the results of putting doubt in the minds of would-be adversaries. I thank you, sir, and I look forward to your uh, follow-up on those other questions. Mr. Chairman, I yield back. Thank you very much. Um, as far as I know, uh, I don't think anyone else seeks time at this point, so we are finished. I don't have anything, Mr. Thornberry, do anything for the go to the order. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, General Alvin, I appreciate that conversation, but uh, I don't think we should pigeonhole current deterrence as presence only. It is decision making now. Presence can be an, and forward based presence has been a fundamental part of our deterrent strategy since the end of World War II. I, I take your point, you can have different ways to evoke the same result in an adversary's decision-making process, uh, but I don't think it's fair to categorize current deterrence as, uh, as, as presence only. Uh, I, I just want to say, Mr. Chairman, that I do appreciate both witnesses being here and, and trying to answer our questions. Um, I think, the bottom line is that, as you and I know, Secretary Esper has been conducting a review of all the combatant commands that has been going on for months. He has kept us abreast of those reviews. What's different is that a couple of staffers in the White House decided that they wanted to try to sell the president on an absolute troop cap for Germany. And if you'll remember, 
that the beginning, it had a, a cap on how many boot, American boots could even be on the ground at the same time, which would prevent Germany from being a transit point of our troops into the Middle East or Africa. They clearly hadn't thought through the consequences. They didn't know how it would be implemented. And so what's happened is Secretary Esper and, and the folks at the Pentagon are trying to put lipstick on the pig or make lemons out of lemonade or whatever colloquialism you want to use. There may be some benefit to some of these moves, as I said at the beginning. My concern is, however, the underlying strength and unity of the alliance has not been a foremost consideration. And uh, so all of that, plus the uh, status of the decision making at the Pentagon, I think has to inform our uh, conference negotiations with the Senate this year and I presume in, in years to come. I yield back. Thank you. I just want to associate myself with, well, I completely agree with what Mr. Thornberry just said. And I, I do think that what Secretary Esper has done with the bottom-up review with the uh, command by command, combatant command um, analysis is, is a very appropriate thing to be doing. And he, he is trying to move our defense strategy forward. Um, but I also concur that the coordination between what DOD is doing and, and what whims come into the heads in the White House um, has undermined that incredibly important effort. Um, we just had the task force report that came out um, uh, led by Seth Moulton and Mr. Banks um, sort of outlining here's the challenge we face. China and, you know, believe it or not, to some degree Russia have leapt ahead of us on, on certain key technologies. Um, technologies that didn't exist, you know, 50 years ago or even 20 years ago in some cases, and, and we've fallen behind on our ability to meet that threat. So rethinking the way we meet the threats that we face within the Pentagon is enormously important. Um, we can't keep doing things the same way we've done them uh, to date. Um, but that, that process takes thought, focus, um, and you know, I, I think we need to let the DOD do their job and not, not interfere with that effort. Um, so I, I certainly agree with that. And I also agree with the point on presence, which I think is, is very important. I, I get asked all the time, you know, we're not, at, we're not at war with, why do we have, you know, the Soviet Union broke up, why do we have troops in Europe? You know, what are they doing there? They are there for a very important purpose. Um, as Thornberry outlined it a little bit and we've heard it today, I think we need to make clearer to the American public why we have troops deployed in Europe, why we have troops deployed um, in South Korea, um, in Okinawa, and elsewhere. They, they serve an incredibly important purpose, and I think we need to make that clear so we can build support uh, for what needs to be done to, to meet the threats that we face. So I, I appreciate you gentlemen being here, appreciate this discussion. I think it has been very helpful. Uh, and with that, uh, we are adjourned.